Welcome from Berlin to our webinar on the future cost of electricity-based synthetic fuels. We're glad to have more than 70 participants online now, and this webinar is based on our joint study by Agora Energiewende and Agora Verkehrswende that we published in April. And this study was published to create more transparency in future discussions on synthetic fuels, and therefore we have commissioned the consulting firm Frontier Economics to analyze cost reduction paths for synthetic fuels and investigate favorable locations in Germany and abroad for generating the renewable power needed to produce those fuels. Building on this cost analysis, then we have drawn our own conclusions in which we discuss priority fields of application of synthetic fuels, necessary conditions to unlock the projected cost reductions, as well as the need for an adequate policy framework, which includes sustainability requirements for synthetic fuels. So, who are we? My name is Matthias Deutsch. I'm a senior associate with Agora Energiewende in Berlin. And I'm Urs Meyer, a senior associate with Agora Verkehrswende, or Transport Transformation. Our presentation today will last about 25 to 30 minutes. Before we begin, allow me a few words on technical stuff and how you can contribute to the discussion later on. All information related to this webinar can be found on our websites. This includes our study on the future costs of electricity-based synthetic fuels, an interactive Excel spreadsheet cost calculator to adjust the underlying assumptions for the cost analysis. You can also download the webinar presentation and the webinar recording, which is also available through a YouTube channel. You can already now download the presentation slides from the webinar software, and a pointer should appear now on your screen indicating where you can download it. And also now a little chat window should appear on your screen that you can use to send us real-time questions on the presentation. We will address these questions in the question and answer session after we have gone through the presentation first. If you pose a question, this question will only appear on our screens. The other webinar participants will not see it. So when replying, we will restate the question first and then try to answer it. It would be kind if you were to mention your name and affiliation when asking a question. We'll try to cover as many questions as possible during the question and answer session. Remaining questions we'll take up by email afterwards. You can also use the chat window to submit technical questions or remarks in case you are experiencing problems with the software. Our colleague Nicolas Bock, who is <coughs> sitting next to me, will seek to help as fast and as far as possible. So thanks Nicolas and also thanks to our colleague Christoph, who is working behind the scenes and keeps the system running technology-wise. So while well, that's it for the introduction, let's get started. And so when we go to the questions later on, uh, I will pass on the questions and at around 5 to 5 p.m. we'll stop questions and answers and then Urs will take over for closure. Well, let's get started then. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hello and a warm welcome from my side as well. When we started this project, there were um, many uh, climate uh, protection scenarios out there um, showing a, a huge demand or a demand at least for uh, synthetic fuels, especially for the time period 2030 to 2050. Um, that's why we commissioned um, Frontier Economics to um, analyze the cost path, as Matthias already said. Um, to get a better idea of what role um, those fields um, might play, should play, could play um, in future, and the energy transition. Um, so what we, um, what we are doing today is we're going to present you uh, our conclusions uh, of the work of Frontier Economics. And um, those are basically four main conclusions. Um, but before I start um, with the first conclusion, uh, I want to say a few more words on our uh, think tanks we work for. Um, we are sharing an office, Agora Energiewende and Agora Verkehrswende. We are about 40 experts, independent and uh, non-partisan. Um, that's because we are financed by uh, two uh, foundations, the Stiftung Mercator and the European Climate Foundation. Um, Agora Energiewende um, started a bit earlier in 2012 
Um, their current uh, phase is financed until 2021, um, and Agora Verkehrswende, as we see it, the, the uh, yeah, little sister, we started in 2016, and we are financed until 2023 so far. Our um, common mission is to develop strategies to decarbonize the energy system in Germany and beyond. Our focus is on power, heating, and transport. And um, what we do is we uh, do analyses ourselves. We commission studies. Um, we um, offer um, a marketplace and a forum or an agora uh, for um, a debate for different social groups. And what helps a lot is that we have a consult that, that we have um, uh, councils of the agoras um, that we can consult with and they consist of high-ranked representatives of um, politics, um, uh, companies, uh, science, and civil society. So that's a few words on who we are. Um, and before we go um, into the uh, main part of the presentation, I want to show you what we're actually talking about. Uh, and th those are the electricity-based synthetic fuels, um, power to gas and power to liquid. Um, so you start at having electricity from renewable energy on your left-hand side. Um, it's very efficient to use that directly, but sometimes you want to store that uh, electricity and um, over a longer period of time or um, yeah, any restrictions uh, you can think of. Um, so you can um, split water with the help of electricity into um, hydrogen and um, oxygen, you get um, an energy carrier that uh, has the advantage that it doesn't can, uh, include any CO2, so there's no uh, CO2 emissions when you use it. Um, but um, uh, a disadvantage first that you have conversion losses creating hydrogen and also that you have an infrastructure and applications um, hardly in place or um, quite expensive, so far at least. So what you want to do when, uh, when you have applications where you can't use electricity directly um, or um, yeah, it's too expensive, um, thinking of um, maritime transport or aviation, then you can add CO2 um, and uh, through the processes of uh, methanation or uh, Fischer Tropsch or the methanol road, you can get uh, power to gas, um, synthetic methane, that's methanation, um, which can be used like um, compressed natural gas or liquefied natural gas, um, or you can um, have liquid fuels, power to liquid, uh, gasoline, diesel, kerosene. What um, the reason why we put it into uh, those uh, pink, um, uh, yeah, why we highlighted is uh, highlighted uh, those two uh, terms is to show you that if we don't state otherwise um, with power to gas and power to liquid, we mean, mean those electricity-based CO2. Um, uh, based fuels. Um, hydrogen certainly is also power to gas, but with our study um, we focus on the CO2 based um, fuels. So let's uh, say a few words about the study. Um, it is commissioned by our two think tanks, Agora Verkehrswende and Agora Energiewende. Uh, Frontier Economics uh, did the work. Um, the guiding questions were how can the cost of importing synthetic fuels, that is methane and liquid fuels, develop until 2050 uh, with an exemplary analysis for North Africa, for Middle East and for Iceland. And uh, the second question uh, to compare that to the, to the German context was what are the costs of producing those fuels on the basis of offshore wind energy in the North and Baltic seas? The approach, um, a cost estimation along the value chain, um, so power generation, conversion, transport, blending, slash distribution. The cost ranges um, uh, Frontier get from, from, uh, from the literature and also from an expert workshop that uh, took place here at uh, the Agoras. And it's um, important to mention that CO2 neutrality was, um, yeah, we got that by assuming CO2 from the air, so direct air capture. 
Let's start with our first um, key conclusion out of four. Um, synthetic fuels will play an important role in decarbonizing the chemical sector, the industrial sector, and parts of the transport sector. And um, we should have a look at how oil and gas are used to do do today. And um, this shows um, the use in Germany in 2015 in terawatt hours. Uh, you can see um, that oil and gas are of crucial importance uh, for Germany. You see that oil is used mainly in transport, but also um, in, energy, in industry for non-energy use, in heating, um, and very little in, in power generation, and that gas um, uh, is predominantly used for, for heating, um, and a little bit, uh, of course, and, and uh, of high importance as well for power generation and uh, combined heat and power plants. You can see on the right-hand side that the energy mix in Germany in 2017 um, was more than 50% dependent on fossil oil and gas. So if we, if we look at the situation right now and we see that against uh, the Paris Agreement, against the background of the Paris Agreement, the German climate protection uh, uh, goals and uh, yeah, other countries' um, climate goals, um, can we um, substitute those fuels uh, on a one-to-one -one basis with the um, electricity-based synthetic fuels we just um, um, introduced? Um, we think no, um, and that is um, mainly uh, because of the uh, conversion losses, because of um, high efficiency losses you get from producing those fuels. So what we did, we, we brought you two examples um, on to visualize those, uh, those uh, conversion losses. And I'll start with the one on uh, transport. You can see here um, individual and overall efficiencies for cars with different vehicle drive technologies in a, in a comparison. Uh, on your left-hand side, you see the battery electric vehicle, and what you can see is that if you put in 100% renewable power, you get 69% um, to use it to get from A to B. If you go for a fuel cell vehicle um, using hydrogen, then you need two and a half times more electricity to get uh, yeah, the same distance traveled. Um, in the end, it's only 26%. Uh, and if you then look at the internal combustion engine vehicle, you see that you need five times more electricity than for the battery electric vehicle, um, mainly because of the conversion losses, but also, and this is, uh, this is important to mention, because of the um, um, yeah, lower um, efficiency of the internal combustion engine vehicle in comparison to the electric motor. Um, so far as to the transport example. So let's also have a look at heating, the heating sector. And uh, by the way, we didn't come up with those figures by ourselves. We just basically drew them from the German National Academy of Engineering that published something in the last uh, fall. And uh, we drew most of the figures from them. So we think that's a pretty robust um, um, understanding of what the conversion losses are. But let's look at the heating sector. Now for the heating sector, you have the electric heat pump, fuel cell heating, and gas condensing boilers in those three rows. And when we look at fuel cell and gas condensing boiler first, you realize starting with renewable power 100%, you end up with about roughly 50% in each case. And let's not argue about a percentage point more or less here or there. Because as I said, again, most figures are from the German National Academy of Engineering. Yes, things may change in the future a little bit, but by and large, the importance here is that when you now look to the left column, electric heat pump, you basically use your renewable power to pump it up, so to speak, and with an annual coefficient of performance of three, you end up with, in this case, like nearly three times as much energy that you can use for heating as you have put in as renewable power. And that is because we can use ambient air, ambient energy from the environment, that is from the air, from soil or water, and then add that to the renewable power and use this entire energy more or less. 
And the comparison is simple. If you compare the 50% in the middle and to the right to the 285% there, you get the idea that what it means to have high conversion losses for synthetic fuels. Now, the open question, of course, is those figures that we just presented for transport and for heating are pretty much physics-based and more or less indisputable in that sense. So can those indisputable disadvantages of synthetic fuels be offset or more than offset by some kind of advantages, for example, by avoidance of infrastructure cost? That's an open question. Our understanding, there's not that much research out there, and there's a need for better research, a better understanding, of, for example, better understanding the gas infrastructure system and under which conditions and where and in maybe in what time frame there could be those advantages that can more than offset those obvious disadvantages. Now, what we have done is we have kind of tried to systematically put all sectors together in a big table that you can find in our publication. And now we go back to transport, which is kind of the first line in this big table of sectors to see what a meaningful priority would be to think about using renewable power. Yeah, and um, here you can see the transport example. Um, in the first column, you see there's a first priority, direct use of electricity, um, and we put together some uh, yeah, means of transport. Um, and we also have uh, in the third and fourth row um, column, um, hydrogen and CO2 based power to gas and power to liquid as supplemental approaches um, as uh, synthetic fuels. So the key messages uh, you can find on your right-hand side, for road transport, the direct use of electricity should have priority. Um, Long-haul trucks and buses will possibly use power to gas and power to liquid, um, although it is more efficient um, in terms of energy use uh, to go for um, uh, overhead catenary, uh, overhead contact line trucks um, or uh, battery powered trucks um, and of course it's always good uh, to say that um, to shift from road to rail so if you but but, but if you want to go for um, for power to gas um, then hydrogen is more efficient than uh, co2 based based power to gas or power to liquid and should therefore have priority um, yeah, um, power to gas and power to liquid will indisputably be employed in the air and sea transport. Um, there it is um, not, uh, yeah, it can't be uh, foreseen today that it will be possible to travel by plane from uh, Europe to Australia just on batteries. Um, so, and, and they, those planes have a long um, life uh, span. So. We certainly will need uh, drop-in fuels for air and sea transport. And so let's have a look again at heating, um, building on what we already said. Now for building heat, the direct use of renewables, and that includes deep geothermal, solar thermal, and that should have priority together uh, with electricity. <clears throat> that means heat pumps for sufficiently insulated buildings. Now that's critical, of course and were useful also in combination with heat grids. Now, when you get to those insulation restrictions, then maybe fuel cell combined heat and power with hydrogen or CO2-based power to gas, power to liquid is a supplemental option that we should look at. This is low temperature. When we look at high temperature heat as process heat in industry, Again, the direct use of electricity should have priority. We should really carefully look at other options. There's, there's a lot of uh, interesting physical processes out there. There's not only resistance heating, there's also infrared heating, some kind of plasma heating, different forms that we should look at before simply switching to the default that we are used to, which is burning stuff. So in the past, we have burned fossil fuels. And here, if we can't go any further, then maybe we will need power to gas, power to liquid for <clears throat> getting high temperature heat as well. There are two other things that we needed to look at, which is industry in, in the broad sense, including chemical industry. Now, obviously, if you need certain molecules, then you cannot just use electricity. So if you have some kind of inorganic uh, chemistry that you want to deal with, then maybe you need hydrogen first, which could be 
the basis for ammonia production, or you could produce steel with direct reduction of iron ore. And if you go to the organic chemistry, of course you need some kind of organic basic chemicals, and there it makes uh, sense to produce synthetic fuels that are CO2 based, and then you can derive other chemicals from that basis. Now, the last thing we want to mention is something that has been up to debate, but I think now it's, it's, the, least, um, it's the least critical problem here when we talk about po the power sector. Because obviously, for the short-term storage, like say storing electricity for a day or so, batteries uh, are a priority in our understanding. So the question is, what do I do if I have long-term storage problems, maybe seasonal storage? There, you need a chemical energy carrier, and so what you will do is produce hydrogen and pro probably also CO2-based power to gas, and then store that, and then reconvert it in gas-fired power plants for those times where there's low feed-in from wind and low feed-in from solar, which is known in Germany as Dunkelflaute. So certainly, power to gas will have a role to play in the power sector for long-term storage, at least when we get closer to very deep decarbonization scenarios of minus 95% or so. So this is what we have talked about so far is the demand side. What is the possible demand for power to gas, power to liquid? Now let's look at the supply side. And there's an interesting discussion going on in Germany for a long time when you ask people, so how do you want to produce those power to gas, power to fuels? And some answer, well, we basically use cheap, excess renewable electricity. Okay, so starting from that, let's have a look at what we, what we conclude in terms of what is the basis of producing power to gas, power to liquid. Our second conclusion is, to be economically efficient, power to gas and power to liquid facilities require inexpensive renewable electricity and high followed hours, that is, high capacity utilization. Excess renewable power will not be enough to cover the power demands of synthetic fuel production. And that is, the question is, how can you operate an electrolyzer, which is kind of the core technology, operate an electrolyzer to make it profitable, to make it competitive. And the literature says you would need at least three to 4,000 hours per year. I mean, if you can, run it all year long, but that's usually not an option. So three to 4,000 hours, can you reach, can you find a source of energy with cheap renewable electricity supply for three to 4,000 hours? Let's have a look at that. And um, what you can see in the upper part of this diagram, and you can see hours per year, and in the upper part it's, it's, uh, we see excess power for Germany, and there are some projections, again by the German National Academy of Engineering, some simulation runs how many hours of excess power, renewable electricity excess power we can expect for the next 10 to 15 years to come. And what you see is, in the next 10 to 15 years, um, this excess power reaches around 1,500 hours per year at maximum. Well, then some people say, well, maybe it's not that we have this excess power in the whole German electricity system. Maybe it's just a regional thing. Maybe it's because of regional and local grid bottlenecks. So there's another study uh, by some researchers that have looked at the northern region, the northern state of Schleswig-Holstein, north of Germany. And they have pretty aggressive uh, wind, onshore wind expansion plans. Now, if they fulfill their offshore expansion plans of the, of the government in Schleswig-Holstein until 2025, they could reach a maximum of around 1,600 hours of excess, of kind of regional excess power, so to speak. Well, both figures for the whole of Germany and for Schleswig-Holstein is not really reaching the three to 4,000 hours you would like to have to run an electrolyzer um, economically. And by the way, for Schleswig-Holstein, there's an additional fact that's, that's critical. Once the transmission, the transmission system has been expanded in uh, Germany, um, then the um, local grid bottleneck will disappear. That means that um, at first you may have local grid bottlenecks and you may have excess power, but once the, uh, the transmission lines have been built, maybe with some years of delay, then all this excess power in that region will 
then disappear and that cannot be a basis for a thousand, maybe four to five thousand hours. That's critical and that is exactly what Frontier has done in the calculation of the synthetic fuel cost at all. So you'll see full cost of renewable energy facilities, you'll see conversion um, plants with electrolyzers and you'll have, as my colleague mentioned at the beginning, CO2 from the air with direct air capture, all factored and priced in to reach or so it's cost estimates of the future. So now let's look at the cost. And I'm on the next slide with our third conclusion. Our third conclusion uh, will come up in a second. Um, uh, sorry, this is again a technical challenge. So what you can see now is that um, what you can see now is that uh, our third conclusion, our third conclusion, is um, that in the beginning synthetic methane and oil will cost between 20 and 30 cents per kilowatt hour in Europe and costs can fall to 10 cents per kilowatt hour by 2050 if, and that's a big if by the way, if global power to gas and power to liquid capacity reaches around 100 gigawatts. Now um, what you will see on the next slide is you will see large cost ranges which is our summary of Frontier's results. You'll see large cost ranges with a reference cost in the middle and um, and that's and we in that diagram we also mixed gas and liquid just to have a big summary with big broad lines of thinking that uh, emerges uh, from this graphic. And so we'll now go to the next slide and um, the next slide shows you a big summary of results. Uh, let's start with the y-axis. The y-axis so shows cent per kilowatt hour and let's then look at the blue cost ranges. Blue represents offshore wind production in the North and Baltic Seas and you see that in the early 20s it goes from 24 cent per kilowatt hour, that's what we call the reference cost it goes down to around 20 cents by 2030 and around, let's say, yeah, 13 to 15 cents by 2050. That's the blue cost ranges. When you look at the very bottom of the diagram, you see fossil prices, fossil cost as a comparison. Those are cost projections from the IEA and the World Bank. It's a mix. And you see that they go slightly up, but at, at the core, the synthetic fuels produced with offshore wind will always be more expensive than fossil fuels. Now look at the, um, the pink color. The pink color represents PV and PV wind systems that <coughs> are produced, that are producing synthetic fuels in North Africa and in the Middle East. The basic idea is pink is less expensive than blue, so it is cheaper to import from the southern Mediterranean than to produce them with offshore wind at home. And then finally there's this greenish color that is the lowest. As I said, it's a mix of geothermal and hydropower in Iceland. The, the point here is that you can't beat that cost-wise, not as easily. But there's only a total potential limited to around 50 terawatt hours per year that we could get from Iceland. So this is an interesting option, but it will not solve Europe's and or Germany's demand for synthetic fuels in total. So it's a good comparison, but it's not the entire uh, solution to everything. So what do we learn from this? As I said, first of all, imports are cheaper according to those cost estimates. And there may be even further cost reductions coming up, something that could not be factored in by, by frontier economics. Maybe PV might be even have more aggressive and faster cost reductions, or maybe batteries may uh, join the entire game. And that could be in favor of the import option if you combine even cheaper PV, <coughs> maybe even someday with batteries in, uh, in the southern Mediterranean. Or you could construct very large chemical factories and plants and reduce cost even further. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that, well, you still need cost of capital. And here, Frontier Economics has assumed a general cost of capital of 6% for all options. Well, uh, some of the North Africa, Middle East 
states may be a bit more risky for investors and therefore a cost of capital may be higher than 6%. So maybe the question of risky states and risky countries where you want to produce the fuel increases the overall cost so that in the end, at least in the middle to long term, it's not that clear that the import option will always be more or will always be cheaper than producing at home with offshore wind. And finally, this is all about cost. So it's cost at the German border. But what about royalties? Uh, some people have told me that it's not obvious that if you want to put it simply, put a chemical plant somewhere into the desert, that you can do that for free. You will have to pay royalty, royalties in all likelihood. And also there will be a, most likely a global power to gas, power to liquid market that will develop in the future. And then we're talking about market prices, which are likely to be higher than the cost that you can see here. So all in all, we see cost reductions. And the final thought on this picture is, will those cost reductions come by themselves? Or is there a necessary requirement? Well, the necessary condition is what we see at the next slide. The necessary condition is a major scale up. We really, and we know that, remember PV? PV came to major cost reductions by scaling up PV on this planet tremendously, first in Germany and some other countries and then in China. And the same question here is, how can we go through the cost learning curve of electrolyzers? And we think that those cost reductions require considerable early and continuous investments into electrolyzers. And that is an international uh, challenge. And when you look at those learning curves, you can come to the conclusion that you need something in the order of 100 gigawatts to reduce cost as Frontier has uh, assessed those cost reductions. Compare that to the global stock today. We have around 20 gigawatts in the chemical uh, industry installed electrolyzers. That is mostly alkaline electrolyzers. That's what the literature says. And so getting from 20 to 100 is quite something. And there are some other uncertainties when it comes to cost. For example, the technology of direct air capture for assuring climate neutrality uh, is less mature than most of the rest of this technology here. And so it's unclear how easily we can reduce cost there. The key idea from the last slide is, well, as long as fossils are so inexpensive, then uh, the, the, um, are so inexpensive, then we need either high CO2 prices to have more synthetic fuels coming up, because by themselves they will not show up in the market. They cannot compete yet with fossil fuels, or you need some other kind of political intervention. So this is both important. And let me add one more thing here. Um, well, on the, on the left side of this diagram, you can see some German climate scenarios. I'll not go into details here, but the simple idea is that there are some scenarios out there for Germany by different institutions that foresee a lot of electrolysis in Germany alone. Um, but the question here really is, can Germany alone bring down the cost to reach those competitive cost levels? And one final thought, and then I'm kind of done with the technical part uh, of this analysis. One word on hydrogen. Hydrogen was not the core of our um, study, but still it's worth reflecting that hydrogen cost, just the production cost, is about half of the one of methane, as you can see in the, in the, in the diagram to the left. So it makes sense to think about uh, hydrogen, especially since you don't need uh, CO2 to produce it, and it doesn't emit CO2. So let's keep thinking creatively about where you can use hydrogen. The big advantage is no CO2 involved, so no need for direct air capture. The big disadvantage is that we cannot simply use existing infrastructure and we cannot simply use um, the end use applications. And with that, I'm handing over to Urs. So from my side, you have heard something about cost reductions, about a necessary massive scale up of electrolyzers of massive investments that we need, and maybe some infrastructure considerations. But I've also said we need political intervention. Now let's think about this political intervention. Yeah, uh, hello. And uh, this is uh, me again. And we are having the next slide in a second. Yeah. Um, the fourth 
um, key conclusion, we need a political consensus on the future of oil and gas uh, that commits to the phase out of fossil fuels, prioritizes efficient replacement technologies, introduces sustainability regulations and creates incentives for synthetic fuel production. Um, to visualize that uh, fourth key uh, conclusion, um, we put together the following slide. And I need Christoph's help again. Okay, so what you can see here um, are the building blocks for an oil and gas consensus as we see it. Um, at the beginning you have, or at the start, what so to say is the, uh, are the greenhouse gas emission reduction goals and you then need an agreement on oil and on oil and gas consensus between politics, economy and uh, civil society. Uh, three um, building blocks. First, phase out of fossil fuels, um, of fossil oil and gas. Um, the new thing can't come if the old one doesn't uh, leave. So we need a gradual decrease in the total use and associated emissions. We need, um, as a second um, a block, a priority for efficient replacement technologies, for example, with battery electric mobility and electric heat pumps. Um, so it's not a one-to-run substitution, as I said at the beginning, uh, when we looked at the um, use of oil and gas uh, in Germany. And the third block, incentives for synthetic fuel production on the basis of sustainability standards for power to gas and power to liquid and application specific targets. What does that mean? I have, a more, I have one more slide on uh, sustainability standards, but um, on uh, using an example uh, for cars, I want to I um, yeah, make it uh, a bit clearer. Um, for cars, there is um, one um, there, there's one uh, directive in place by the European Union on CO2 from cars, um, the uh, CO2 in fleet um, legislation. Uh, cars need to get uh, more efficient. The uh, um, CO2 per kilometer um, in gram CO2 should uh, should be reduced. There are strict uh, targets. And um, this increases the efficiency from a tank to wheel uh, perspective. So this is priority for efficient replacement uh, technologies. Um, battery electric vehicles have an advantage here. Um, and then incentives for synthetic fuel production. This should be um, on the uh, on the fuel side, on the emission factor side. Um, so um, if you want to have uh, power to gas, power to liquid, um, if you would want to have that in, uh, in cars, then you would go for um, the uh, renewable energy directive that um, decreases the emission factor of, um, uh, yeah, of, of, of fuels, of, of liquid fuels. Um, so it is not a good idea to uh, look at the CO2 from cars legislation and to integrate um, power to gas, power to liquid there. Um, but to keep that separated tank to wheel and um, well to tank legislation. So application specific means we want to have um, a priority for the use of um, power to gas, power to liquid in maritime transport and in aviation and uh, certainly not as a priority option uh, for cars. Let's have a look um, on the slide on the sustainability standards. Um, we have um, five. Um, the first one is minimum greenhouse gas reduction. Uh, and we think that the entire production chain of synthetic fuels um, should lead to um, only um, yeah, to, to 70 percent um, reduction in comparison to conventional fossil fuels. This is um, what the European Union with their Renewable Energy Directive um, um, 2 um, is going to say about uh, advanced biofuels. So it's important to, um, to have that um, yeah, standard um, because when you look at 
the conversion losses, uh, you must see that um, the emission factor needs to be multiplied by um, 1.9 if you want to go for power to liquid. Um, so even with um, even with power to uh, gas on the basis of uh, of uh, PV energy, you only have a reduction of 80 percent because uh, PV production of electricity also has got a uh, emission factor. So the second and the third one um, are kind of um, um, yeah, reasons for the minimum uh, greenhouse gas reduction. You have the additional renewable electricity generation. It's important to have um, n yeah, additional renewable energy uh, stations. Um, and you make uh, need to make sure that uh, it's not uh, just a, a new mix. Um, the the uh, concerned uh, consumers take the good um, electricity, and the uh, the ones that are not interested get the grey ones. So it be a change in the in the mix in, in in overall. And also, it's important to think of the perspective that um, you have the production of uh, power to gas, power to liquid in North Africa um, or the Middle East, um, and it can't be the case that uh, the uh, energy tr transition there uh, gets slowed down um, by uh, the usage of, uh, of the electricity, um, the green electricity produced there uh, for fuels that go to um, yeah, Western Europe, for example. Um, then we have CO2 from sustainable atmospheric sources. Um, we say that only CO2 captured from the air or sustainable biogenic sources create a closed carbon neutral CO2 cycle. Um, if this cannot be achieved, all CO2 emissions are to be counted. Um, well, what is what is the reason um, that we say uh, this and and uh, say it's not a good idea to use um, uh, CO2 from, uh, for example, the cement industry or the steel uh, production? Um, we think there should be not even such a transitional phase uh, because we um, need uh, investments in the key technology uh, for. Uh, climate neutral um, power to gas and power to liquid, and if you um, look at the price price differences um, for CO2 from uh, from those industries or from uh, direct air capture, uh, it's a big difference. Um, I uh, brought the numbers here. You have for direct air capture for PT power to gas uh, today uh, 145, um, 100 uh, more or less in 2030. And from the cement industry in Germany, it's uh, 30 uh, euro uh, per ton CO2 uh, right now. So that's a it's a big difference, and there won't be that um, pressure on um, yeah investments in direct air capture that you would see if uh, if you um, yeah don't use uh, recycled uh, CO2, so to say. Um, there are various other options why um, CO2 um, shouldn't be used from those uh, from, from from those areas, but uh, this might be then a part of the discussion afterwards. Um, we have further on sustainable use of water and land um, that uh, yeah should be obvious, and we have uh, social sustainability of fuel production. Um, so that uh, the country where the uh, the fuel is produced. Uh, keep some some uh, main uh, sustainability um, aspects and uh, what we say is that the portion for example of the revenues uh, must go towards sustainable local development um, I want to I want to keep it with like that and uh, have some time for for discussion but I want to at the end um, um, uh, yeah, show our conclusions drawn at a glance. Synthetic fuels will play an important role in decarbonizing uh, the chemical sectors, um, and the industrial sector, and parts of the transport sector. Um, second, to be economically uh, efficient, power to gas uh, and power to liquid facilities require inexpensive renewable electricity and high full load hours. So excess renewable power will not be enough to cover the power demands of synthetic fuel production. Third, um, in the beginning, synthetic methane and oil will cost between 20 and 30 cents per kilowatt hour in Europe. Um, 
costs can fall to 10 cents per kilowatt hour by 2050 if global power to gas and power to liquid capacity reaches around 100 gigawatts. Um, Matthias uh, explained that. So, and the fourth point, we need a political consensus on the future of oil and gas um, that commits to the phase out of fossil fuels, prioritizes efficient replacement technologies, introduces sustainability regulations, and creates incentives for synthetic fuel production. Um, that's uh, our conclusions um, at a glance. And uh, thank you very much for, uh, for um, yeah, listening uh, under these uh, complicated conditions here. And uh, we look forward to your questions. Um, thank you. Okay. So, Christoph Graf um, says, hi guys, is there a use case uh, where it is more profitable to produce, huh? now it's gone, is there a use, <laughs> to produce heat instead of gas or liquid, okay, well, is there, is, Different um, conditions, complicated. May I use the the mouse, please, Christoph? Okay. So we have we have Leonard uh, Push from Evomom. Which requirements does the water need to fulfill? And um, I, it, it needs to be um, desalinated water, uh, needs to be fresh water, um, so to have uh, such a plant in uh, Northern Africa, so to s um, for example, uh, you need a desalination uh, plant where you get uh, fresh water. Um, Christoph Graf, um, that's the question uh, I was uh, going to read uh, before it uh, somehow vanished from our computer here. Hi guys, is there a use case where it is more profitable to produce heat instead of gas or liquids? How could that case look like? And um, I would actually like to hand that over to Matthias. Well, <coughs> yeah, thank you. Interesting question. Uh, there's nothing that uh, comes to my mind directly. The point is that gas or liquids just have a very high energy quality. I can, as far as I understand it, I can always derive some kind of heat from gas or liquids and therefore it is such a high quality that I, it's for me it's hard to see this uh, case where it's more profitable. Uh, that will be my first impression and uh, therefore I can give you such a case because the one can always be derived from the other. Um, so let's let's jump to the next one. Stefan Schönberger asks, why is synthetic methane equally expensive as synthetic liquids, for example, kerosene? Uh, good question. Uh, we were also surprised when we got the results. Um, I encourage you to look at the this interactive uh, Excel spreadsheet calculator that we put online, also in English and in German. Um, the point is that there, there are two components, and in one case it's it's less expensive, and in the other case it's a bit more expensive. So gas and liquids kind of um, it's very close together in the range of cost because those two components uh, just uh, cancel each other out, and therefore those two cost ranges overlap. I can't give you much, I cannot give you more details at this point here, uh, but if you have more questions, uh, drop me an email, and we can look at that together. Uh, but it's just about two components that cancel each other out. Other than that, uh, I understand your question well. That's um, it's surprising at, at first. So there's somebody without a name. So one thing to consider would be checking the assumptions of frontier economics on the power to gas and especially power to liquid costs, which may be too optimistic. Yes, 
absolutely. I encourage you to check those assumptions. That exactly, that's exactly why we provide the, the spreadsheet and the interactive calculator. Uh, if you come to the point, to the conclusion that there's something you don't buy, then please contact us. That's definitely interesting. What you get from the study is that Frontier took a whole range of studies for investment costs and other cost components to um, build a kind of, we think, a very robust case and then come up with the cost ranges. And again, those are cost ranges and I mostly referred to the kind of middle reference cost, but we certainly understand that the ranges are much lower and higher and have uh, something that is that is uh, different from the, the, the numbers that we quoted when we said 20 to 30 cents and 10 cents. That's a simplification. They are cost ranges. Markus Ostermeyer asks, CO2 from direct air capture is very expensive. Have you taken CO2 from biogas into consideration? CO2 from biogas should be for free. Um, so that part of the question, uh, no, we tried to develop a vision for synthetic fuels that looks at large volumes in the long run for deep decarbonization. Yes, biogas makes sense and for certain pathways and for certain volumes, uh, it will certainly be part of the solution. But it's no, that was not our ambition. Our ambition was to look at the large volumes and long run climate neutrality. And that's why we only looked at direct air capture. What you find in our uh, spreadsheet tool, though, is you've, you have the option to include uh, CO2 emissions from the cement industry. I understand that that's not the same as biogas, but at least you can play around to see how um, how a less expensive CO2 cost play out in the calculation. So there's a second part of the question asking from by Markus Ostermeyer for electrolysis, water is necessary. Producing power to gas, power to liquid in the desert could be a problem. Has this been taken into consideration? Water is part of the cost calculation. What you find in the calculation again in the spreadsheet tool is water is a minor cost component. This is something that uh, I've talked to people in the industry. Uh, let's say a large German supplier of components has said yes, that is um, consistent with their understanding and their estimate how kind of inexpensive water in the desert would be. Uh, again, please scrutinize our assumptions wherever you can. Uh, this is our state of knowledge, but that's exactly why we put this online to scrutinize this and to put, bring forward the discussion and provide transparency. Assuming costs, next part of the question by Markus, last part by Markus Ostermeyer, assuming costs of 150 euros per ton for CO2 makes the methane very expensive, especially for a start biogenic CO2 could be used and this should be available for free. This is more or less the same uh, question that I wrote on biogas. Uh, yes, but again, we have tried to, uh, to paint a, a broad picture for the future large volumes. Uh, we have not so much focused on what could be the best a most inexpensive start, but rather what, what's the, the solution in the long run with large volumes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm aware that we are approaching uh, the 5 p.m. Um, I, I, can we extend the time a little bit? Uh, so our chief technical advisor here says we could kind of go a bit further than just 5 p.m. So let's uh, add another 10 minutes, I would say. That should be appropriate here. So Carlos Arruego is asking, what's the level of CO2 prices required. We have not assessed uh, the level of CO2 prices required. What you find instead is, and, and the reason is the following, there has been a long discussion on higher CO2 prices in the European uh, Emission Trading System, ETS, and the usual defense line of some industries is, whoa, we cannot afford to have such high CO2 prices. So our understanding is, even though it would be economically advantages to have a high common CO2 price that is not going to happen anytime soon. And therefore, we have rather uh, added uh, our conclusion that we think it's rather likely to have an additional instrument. In this case, it could be something like a quota that incentivizes uh, green or renewable gas or liquids in the system instead of just waiting for a CO2 price that is high enough, which may be a long, uh, long time to wait. A uh, second part by Carlos Arruego is the question, in the slide 20, you mentioned additional renewable electricity generation using guarantees of origin, for example, imported from hydro in Norway. Would it be a valid option? Um, guarantees of origin imported from hydro in Norway. Well, uh, if something is already there, 
like many imported hydro plants in Norway, it's obviously not additional in our sense if we want to have kind of additional renewables to uh, to decarbonize, especially the heat and transport sector. So I cannot really imagine something that's already there now to count as additional renewables. I could add on that. Very good question. Thank you very much for that. Um, we have a, a perspective where we look um, for the reasons Matthias explained um, at um, huge production sites um, um, where you have um, very good um, places to have wind power and PV power um, and where you where you need uh, access to the water desalination plant and so on. Um, if you think of smaller uh, plants in, in Germany, for example, it is uh, of course more complicated to have um, um, additional um, renewable electricity generated uh, with no connection to the grid as we as we say it here. Guarantees of origins would be a solution for that. However, what we want to make sure is that uh, there really is um, this really is additional uh, to uh, the energy mix we have so, so far. And discussions about that are then, for example, uh, following the line that um, there are some windmills in Germany uh, in northern parts where um, the uh, the, the feed-in system uh, doesn't, uh, it, yeah, it's it's uh, it's just run out, and uh, you have um, you have that windmill, and you could use it for such a plant. And uh, well, um, it has been financed by uh, by the public, uh, by this by the electricity users. Um, yeah, to make uh, to make sure that it is additional, uh, we think it is best to have actually no connection to the grid. Uh, and uh, guarantees of origin would mean a connection to the grid, and it would mean, um, um, yeah, an exchange of of, uh, of electricity um, quantities. What is uh, the next question? For example, is um, on slide 15. What is the share of total costs coming from uh, carbon capture? Um, we we don't have it here with us in this room. Uh, it was prepared with extra slides we had um, in the original system. Um, but yeah, Mati well, Matthias is looking it up actually. Um, I'll go for the next uh, questions. That's, that's, uh, well, then uh, we'll change again. Yeah. Um, yeah sorry for the the, the technology here. Um, you again, as I say, you can always look, try to look up those um, cost answers in our Excel spreadsheet tool. What you find on of page 84 of the report um, is the following phrase: the costs of capturing CO2 from the air make up about 10 to 15 percent of the total costs of methane production. 10 to 15 percent. Uh, and also, as I said before, seawater desalination is negligible. Uh, so those are two. Uh, cost components that are of course under discussion, but they don't make a big uh, uh, component here in our calculations. But again, look that up in, in, in the calculator. There's another question. Um, what is the hydrogen based on? And I think this question refers to the slide where we compare hydrogen with methane, because that is the only hydrogen cost that we really had here in our presentation. And the question is, does it come from the Baltic wind or PV in Africa? And on the slide, you can see that uh, in the footnote, it should say uh, the hydrogen and the methane are both produced based on PV in, I think it's North Africa. Um, it's, in the, it's in the footnote. And so that's one example calculation. And, and the core message is um, the, the hydrogen is about 50% the production cost of the methane. Um, we already had that question on heat, so we, we skipped that one. That was one of our first questions. Now we uh, move on to Julien Festio, who's asking, why is electric batteries in shipping not feasible? Ships can easily handle, uh, can easily carry very high loads. Uh, I put this over to... Um, there are actually ships that use batteries, um, but only for shorter distances. And if you think of uh, container ships um, going from Asia to Europe, um, 
um, there, there is no case that you um, use the uh, the ability to carry rate uh, for the batteries uh, and uh, so much less for uh, the goods you want to uh, you want to transport you want to ship. Um, so there will certainly be more ships using batteries. Um, there are some some hybrid concepts. Um, um, yeah, already uh, on on the waters. Um, for example, those ships that uh, those boats that um, I don't know the English term, but uh, help other boats uh, that are approaching harbors uh, to find the right uh, place in that harbor, and so um, and for for maintenance, uh, some boats. So it is definitely an option, and there will be more electric batteries. Um, well, um, I want to use that uh, that chance, that opportunity, to say that. Uh, for example, in Norway, it was announced by some airport um, operator to have uh, uh, short distance flights with uh, battery electric planes. Um, there was also um, EasyJet that said they want to have short uh, f uh, distance um, battery electric flights. Um, whatever that, uh, how, how realistic that is. Um, it, it it might be a very efficient uh, way to uh, to use planes, um, but uh, looking at longer distances, um, that is um, certainly not very uh, likely to to have that uh, in the next uh, decades. So the next question by Frank Brüning: How high is the current market price for methane at the moment, uh, and how high is it? Uh, if you make it from electrolysis at the moment, um, we would have to. Ah, oh, you, you, you know. It. Well, well, yeah, no. The, the one thing is that I wanted to add is that we are approaching, unfortunately, uh, the end of the session. We take this question and then see, but I'm just um, saying that we cannot do this much longer. So, the current market price for methane at the moment. Well, the, the question of uh, cost and prices. So we have looked at cost here. And, and one thing that you get from uh, the slide with the cost where we present the overview is that we really start by 2022. That's not today, and I acknowledge that. It's for the simple reason that we think we're talking about those huge plans that need to be constructed, and you need to build them. So we cannot talk about uh, the cost today, because really, if you want to provide a relatively inexpensive methane from North Africa, that will take some years to construct large chemical factories there. And therefore, we have started with 2022 because we think that's a reasonable time period. And then you can see that 2022 would be something like uh, 18 cents is the reference cost. And, and fossil uh, methane cost and natural gas is more like uh, 2 to 3, rather 2 cents. Uh, and that's it's a big gap. And therefore, we think the market by itself will not provide synthetic fuels. Um, Maybe one more question here. I think then we are approaching, unfortunately, the end. Uh, Stefan Eppler from Bosch asks, which incentives for synthetic fuel production do you have explicitly in mind? Who should pay the learning curve? Which application? Uh, I think let me try to answer this uh, in, in a broad way. So the incentives for synthetic fuel production, we have explicitly in mind that there could be, could be something like a quota. And it means the quota in a broad sense, would mean there's a requirement for someone, be it the one who's, for example, selling um, selling natural gas today, or the one maybe operating the grid, but someone has the uh, obligation to bring in a certain percentage of uh, renewable gas or, or power to gas into the system, and then he or she will certainly try to uh, take that cost and um, uh, put the cost over to, to her, his or her customers. So in the end, uh, the fossil fuels will increase because there's an obligation to have a certain percentage, a certain increasing percentage, increasing over time of blending more and more synthetic fuels, more green fuels into the, the product. Uh, that's kind of the level of abstraction that we have discussed so far. Um, there could be another arrangement, but we think in the end it's kind of the cost, uh, the, the basis of those who pay for it should be those who are paying for the fossil fuels. So we think uh, designing an incentive should be then financed by those who are today uh, consuming fossil fuels. That means in the end, fossils would increase 
due to an obligation to blend in um, power to gas, power to liquid. So that's at that level of abstraction, I think we can answer this here. And final question, who should pay the learning curve? Well, we think it will be expensive. It will be incredible investment into the learning of electrolyzers and some other components, CO2, direct air capture. So this what is what we call a global 100 gigawatts challenge. We don't see that a country like, for example, Germany alone would pay for all those electrolyzers because it's a global challenge and a global learning curve. And once costs have fallen here, remember the story of PV. They will fall uh, all over the planet at some time and then we will all benefit from that. And therefore it's a global challenge and a global obligation to get the cost down there. Thank you very much. I think at this point we're saying thank you for listening. Thank you for asking. Again, there are some open questions here. We're sorry for that and for the technical delay, but we still have those questions. Um, as long as we have your email, we can kind of try to answer them uh, bilaterally. Uh, yeah, mentioned the newsletters. Well, then uh, a very important uh, note at the very end. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mention that we have newsletters on our websites, Agora Energiewende, Agora Verkehrswende. We won't spam you uh, with mailings, but uh, it's an option for you to keep up to date on our activities. And uh, yeah, as said, uh, we want to um, I want to follow up on the on the questions that are left uh, and just from my side thank you very much for your interest and for your active participation um, and uh, yeah under those uh, a bit more complicated uh, circumstances and it's it's a it's a good opportunity to say <laughs> thank you to uh, Christoph uh, and Nicola who um, uh, yeah stayed calm uh, when the computer just started um, uh, turning off. So thank you, thank you uh, too, and um, see you next time.